yeah the recording started yeah. that i use that to start yeah, uh, yeah. use this song you want the laser pointer uh, it comes here okay yeah in case you need the laser pointer. okay the mouse here also this is just the mouse which one this yeah sure yeah. okay well uh thank you for this opportunity delighted to help, uh to talk about uh one of the areas of the research um that my team is working on uh mainly um that, you know, I will talk about this um, next generation of uh, AI, um, the way or next phase of AI, I would say. So the US agency of DARPA uh, divided the AI's evolution in three phases. The first phase is uh, symbolic AI, and uh, that was, you know, last century. And uh, the first two decades of this century and still going on is the statistical AI. Um, symbolic AI was handcrafted rules, expert systems. I built my first expert system in 1988. Um, that was chrome plating of L, L, uh, military aircraft landing gear. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, then um, the second phase of AI, this AI is largely driven by access to availability of very large amount of data. And um, I saw so it is more of a data driven AI and um, you know the first decade was all about um, you know the traditional machine learning models VEKA and all those tools that we used to use uh, in 2012 the major um, you know progress came in the form of uh, deep neural networks in 2017 yet another inflection point in the form of transformer model and um, uh, that is going on, which has led to this generative AI, which is very, very popular now. And suddenly, because of the success of this generative AI, again, AI is now, you know, in the kind of very broadly kind of accessible, more than 100 million users uh, in a short period for chat GPT and so on and so forth. So all that has happened. But the third phase of AI, as DARPA is defined, is the one that is centered around uh, hybrid AI, um, but one where uh, you can explain what's happening. Now, the second phase of AI, statistical AI, um, while it has uh, had some wonderful successes, um, it has, has quite a few uh, limitations. Uh, today, because of the success of these applications, we have not talked enough about them. But you just started to see a big um, shift happening this year alone. Uh, the shift happened in the context of uh, thousands of um, uh, lead AI leaders, leaders, researchers, technocrats writing this letter uh, about uh, delaying, uh, not, not coming up with the next GPT for uh, six months. And um, um, uh, the, uh, you know, Hinton uh, leaving a, Google so that he can, Jeffrey Hinton, so they can talk about uh, what he has uh, observed recently and what he fears. And that is all along safety, largely. There are other internet issues, but key issue is the safety. And safety is very much tied with ethics and uh, with the trust in AI. Um, so this neurosymbolic AI, which seeks to combine both uh, the statistical and symbolic AI. Um, it's not like taking the you know, technology of first phase, second phase, and just putting together. There's something more to it. Uh, you have to do it differently. But nevertheless, uh, it says that both of these aspects are very important. And that is uh, this third phase of uh, you know, AI, which we kind of start, just starting to enter. And so I will talk a few things about it as we go along. Um, and in the context um, of doing that, I will talk about some applications that are um, around social good or social, you know, harm area. The AI Institute um, currently has about 50 researchers 
six full six. Uh, you just had seventh full time faculty, two research faculty, and then thirty PhD students, and then other students and research staff. And already we have pretty large portfolio. So in the center, you see some of the um, the core AI work uh, that includes large language models and generative AI increasingly. And I have not updated this, this slide for two, more than two years now. Uh, and on the outside is the translational AI research. Uh, the context of this is that uh, my institute was set up uh, from the start as university wide institute. And uh, it is to bring in, you know, AI for uh, the campus as a whole. Uh, the, so even though we are um, you know, administratively situated in the College of Engineering, uh, you know, from the beginning we started, uh, you know, heavy work on with in collaboration with. So we already collaborate with about 10 colleges and schools in the university. Ours is a tier one university, uh, the state uh, flagship university. Um, uh, and um, as you can see, a lot of areas are already covered. I'll talk about a few of them uh, as the time permits. Um, I. Of the area that is of most importance um, to the conference today here is this interpretive, experimentation, safety, trust ethics in AI. Uh, but uh, you know there are many other issues. Uh, there are many interesting things going on. There are a couple of areas that we are more or less a world leader in. Um, this area called knowledge graph, uh, uh, work in ontology and knowledge graph is. Um, something that we always uh, led for many years. My, you know, a large portfolio of uh, work is in that area. Uh, we developed 50 plus knowledge graphs or ontologies. Many of them are public, open source. Uh, others are used by the company I started. Uh, so both commercial and uh, open source ontologies. And now we do many other things uh, of various nature. Um, uh, we have a variety of growth areas. Neuroscience, brain science is just one of them. In fact, um, on my way back, uh, I'll be visiting the brain science department at Imperial College. Um, uh, okay, and I can talk about all of these for a very long time, but I won't. Uh, this is a little bit about knowledge graph. Um, this is um, an area that has not received as much importance as machine learning has. But it is my belief that it is going to receive a lot more importance than it has ever. Uh, both of us, Zawan and I, have in the past belonged to an area called semantic web, where ontologies were, you know, core component of that uh, for the symbolic AI kind of work. But um, it did not scale, or the process, you know, what the way we develop those ontologies uh, were designed by humans and. Um, uh, was expensive and costly to develop, uh, but now uh, with the tools we have developed uh, that you know support all of these things, we can uh, scale this. Uh, we have one project in pharma uh, for pharma application. We have an application, we have an ontology called Percuro, which has six million um, entities and growing with from ten different large sources. Uh, or from medicine and uh, you know drug development and uh, and such. And this is very important. I'll give you the simple analogy. A simple analogy is just our human brain. Uh, human brain has been modeled for, or uh, you know, uh, AI developing AI. Uh, but uh, human brain is not only um, about taking the data, sensory data. We get about 11 million bits per second of sensory data. But our brain is able to convert that 11 million bits into a few bits per second that we detain, that we really co consciously uh, think about and verbalize and you know communicate and you know such. So there is a massive amount of abstraction being done, right? So um, this is this has led to the Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel, Nobel uh, uh, Economic uh, you know uh, award of, of by um, uh, called System One and System Two, uh, where System One is the fast system, you know, perception and system two is deliberative system that thinks. So very rough analogies. System one is this uh, statistical AI. System two is this symbolic AI. Uh, you know, and again, I, I say it's very rough um, uh, and both are needed. 
you know, we, we may observe something and we may retain it and we recall it later on. That is system two. We observe it immediately, act upon it, so system one, right? And our brain does this job very, very well. And, you know, we do, and we have multiple possible tiers of processing. Uh, and, and, you know, we can deal with different levels of abstractions. Uh, uh, computers today don't really. Uh, so uh, there are two tasks, uh, abstraction and analogy, that many of the top AI researchers have talked about as uh, the next goal. Uh, Dennis Husband is, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, CEO of uh, DeepMind, for example, uh, or, or Andy Nguyen, or, uh, you know, Otsioni. They all have talked about, you know, abstraction as a challenge for, you know, AI today. To get there, though, this new symbolic AI, uh, it will be the path. We developed, for example, a, a tool, a platform that called Empower that, you know, develops all these. I won't talk about it today. So um, um, I was uh, I'm reusing the slides for a keynote I gave uh, at a conference uh, that was scheduled that was organized by one of the UK universities and that was on social good AI for social good. So I those applications, but you know, this they, they apply to many other things. Um, so uh, just starting with some applications uh, where apply yeah, 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 social good. Uh, I had a national science funded project uh, on uh, harassment on social media. Um, I um, had one on gender based violence. Um, uh, here uh, we uh, took seven countries uh, and this was in collaboration with the United Nations Population Fund. Um, you know, seven countries were Philippines, India, Nigeria, uh, United States, and South Africa. And we studied harmful practices, sexual violence, physical violence. Uh, seven million tweets, 17 million tweets were analyzed to get a sense of all of those things. Um, uh, use of, um, you know, uh, emergency relief coordination on social media. So people have a request for help, and there are institutions like FEMA in US uh, that are that have resources to help. How do you connect them, right? And um, uh, in one of the projects that I had um, uh, called Twitteris project, um, this project started on the day um, terrorists struck India. Uh, in fact, I remember the day. It was uh, November 6, 2008, I believe, or 2000, 2009, November 6, 2009. Six and seven and eight. And um, so I saw all this Twitter data coming and Flickr data in those days uh, for images. And uh, you can get each individual piece of information, but you can't get a situational awareness. You can't get a sense of what, what is happening. The test took nine places over three days, and that holds sense, and you can't get there. So I said, well, we need to develop a system. We can develop a system doing so. But then that system got used in um, uh, Kashmir floods where people tweeted to request rescue, saying I'm stuck on the third floor of a, um, a uh, of a hotel. My child is sick. We need to be rescued. Uh, uh, we put together, my team put together international uh, team of coordinators. Using our tool, they identified these uh, requests and sent to uh, army, Indian army uh, rescue team who went and actually picked up the things. So, so we continued this effort while the active or crisis was active. But the same system that got used uh, during 2012 election, where I correctly predicted um, uh, the outcome of that election, during 2014 um, Indian election for Modi, uh, during uh, Brexit, uh, correctly identified Brexit, uh, you know, results uh, before. Um, uh, and at that time, I had a colleague company I founded using the technology, and one of the customers was a hedge fund, uh, a UK hedge fund. And uh, then uh, we predicted 2016 election. Uh, Trump also before uh, you know the election, you know, uh, uh, well on the election day before the results were out, where everybody was predicting Hillary Clinton win. We we did that, and this were you know so many of the polls were all wrong. Many many, many uh, very all polls were wrong really for Brexit and for uh, US 2016 election. So anyway, uh, but this that technology got used for this kind of thing also. Um, the challenge was that the number of tweets that asked for help were less than around 1%, and number of tweets that uh, offered help 
were 0.02 percent. So uh, those in our computer science uh, know the challenge with the imbalance and that kind of problem. So there are those kind of issues that we have to solve. Um, the toxicity, uh, you know, on social media uh, is another topic. Uh, and uh, so now coming to the more of a technology part of it and um, I encourage if, if you want to ask questions, then I can go deep into any of the things. Otherwise, I'll remain really, really at the high level of the things. So, uh, current language model, of course, are all about um, you know predicting the next word, right? Or next letter rather, right? And the next word. So, what is coming next? That's all. You know, that's the key property that they have. And then, you know, by very interestingly bringing uh, in the chat. Framework Chat GPT really took that GPT into really you know very large application sphere. Uh, but um, what you have is what is called as distributional semantics. So with these enormous amounts of training tokens, they give you the distributional plausibilities. But they really don't understand. They're not grounded in the real world. They really don't have any understanding. So I, we call this natural language processing, but no understanding. They don't know that this is a real person. They don't know that this person has, we know several things about this Polish person also, right? So they don't have, uh, they're not grounded in physical or conceptual reality. This can be obtained by putting the semantics into the system, by putting the world model or knowledge graph into the system. I know from Wikipedia that uh, you know so and so person, especially not everybody in the world, but uh, you know many well-known persons. Uh, I know when they were born, and I know what are the positions they held, and you know you can look at you know what year I was elected fellow of, and all those things are there, right? So many of such things you can, or who was the 45th president of US, uh, you can do that. To language model, you can ask the question, who was the president of um, US in 2048? And the answer uh, can vary, but one at once it was tried, the answer was Barack Obama. And uh, by using Wikipedia, we will know that that can't be, or, or you, know, you, you, you don't even need Wikipedia for that. By having time, you know that it, that can't be, because that, that's the future, right? And you don't know. So, but the grounding can be brought by, um, and world, real world semantics can be brought by uh, the use of knowledge. So, um, no, sorry, it is not 248, but it was this one. So you could ask that. Uh, the Obama just won 2032 election. It will give you an answer. Right? Um, what happens? And this is the... Um, uh, you, you know, just the insight that um, every thing, every, sim every token that a language model processes, it computes the probability with other tokens. And that uh, some of the probabilities are very small. And in that case, you know, there's too little actually to go by. But yet, if you are going to ask the question that uh, deals with the tokens that are very Poorly, weakly connected, it still will make up something. That is where hallucination or some of the key problems of uh, the language models arise. So um, they does not have context, does not understand. So question is, uh, what was the color of the white horse of Napoleon? And it would have a problem. Right? It does not understand that you are talking about. Oh, it's only given in the question. Or things like this. Uh, Mike's mom had four kids, three of them were XYZ. What is the name of the fourth kid? So, uh, and, and, and the answer can be obvious, but it would not be able to reason that. Or um, here, it was asked uh, Amit Sheth is the director of AIC, Professor Sheth leads several research projects at the Institute. And then you ask for AIC and it will make up. 
artificial and integrated intelligence system center. Smart enough to uh, recognize the um, you know acronym and the first letter, but it just made up, right? And, and you know my guess is why it made up this why why it made up. So what happened is that uh, uh, you know 20, 30 years ago I used to work on in, in information integration. And if you look at any corpus that is, where my name appears, there will be a lot of mention of information, information systems, integration systems, intelligence systems, and it uh, you know made up from that, right? But there is a fact. There is a wiki a LinkedIn page with 10,600 followers that says AI is AI is CE is AI is of South Kenya. So um, uh, and then you say what institute does Amit belongs to? It answers I'm not aware of specific institute, right? So now now uh, caveat. This is uh, you know GPT 3.5, GPT 4. May solve some of these problems. Will it solve all problems? I doubt it, but it will solve some of the problems. These are just some of the challenges um, the, for natural language understanding, time, recency, common sense, a hallucination, user explainability, application level safety. Very important issues here, right? So, so there has been a um, uh, number of AI systems that have been built which perform better than doctors or clinician or medical, uh, you know, medical professional. And yet not all of them will get used or will be used. Why? Because uh, the system uses the answer but does not explain why. Now, if you are a doctor, you are obliged to and required to follow a clinical practice guideline, a protocol that you have to follow. Right? That the, the, uh, you know, if you are uh, a star specialist, uh, the discipline has set up a guideline some is divided in these four categories, uh, you know, mild, medium, medium, severe, and severe, and that uh, how, how do you categorize all of those? Those are that is a medical knowledge. They apply that knowledge, they distinguish between knowledge, they understand transition from one level to another level. Well, this doesn't have that knowledge, so um, it can't uh, explain what. Uh, the result it has come up with, prediction it has come up with, or classification it has come up with. In that context, uh, you know, so so then doctors can't use it. They cannot write their uh, medical record saying I have determined this, this, this because of that X, Y, Z, right? So our neurosymbolic approach takes the clinical process guideline and integrates with the language model to ensure that the language model becomes. Uh, so so basically a, a very operative term is guide guardrails. So we. Develop the guardrails and we add the guardrails to the generative system by using that knowledge and how to use that knowledge in the processing. Okay, so that is the core of the neurosymbolic AI that mm -hmm. we develop in this in this application example. So, um, you know, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, language processing versus language understanding and you have developer interpretability. So there have been some explainability framework in AI, but they are for AI system developer. They are not for end user. They, they might tell you, uh, uh, you know, Lime and Sharp and those tell you that uh, this particular uh, technique is, you know, working on this in the particular on this data to give you this answer. That has nothing to do with what a uh, clinician would want from the system. So that is the user explainability. You have to explain in the terms of the application or the user of the system. To be able to do that, we argue that you need the knowledge of that discipline. And so that is how we um, you know, see the evolution. So, uh, you know, this is the stuck GPT framework uh, on the GPT, you know, 3.5. And. Uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, it, the, it makes things up in spite of that. I already gave that example. Um, now, just as part of some insight. 
um, what happened is that for chat GPT, they had 40 humans to capture breadth of, you know, uh, and train the system. How can you um, expect 40 humans to bring in the whole knowledge about the world and diverse disciplines? In the disciplines where even the experts don't necessarily fully agree, and a lot of processes contextual in nature, you're given a blood pressure of um, uh, 130 over 80, and uh, it means different for um, uh, a uh, uh, you know uh, a white American, and it different. It means different for an an Indian uh, you know uh, American or Asian Indian. Reason is that um, uh, you know for uh, the Asian Indian. Um, uh, or South Asian Indian, uh, a South Asian person, uh, they need the blood pressure to be on the lower side than um, you know many other ethnic groups uh, because they have much hard, uh, higher incidence of heart attack and various other genetic musical reasons for for that. That has to be interpreted, right? That has to be brought in. How can how can forty humans uh, give you all that? And how can and what they primarily do is, is to label. So they capture the knowledge as a label. How can reduce a complex understanding of a, a problem to a singular label? There's a lot of information lost when you do that. On the other hand, there do uh, exist very large knowledge bases and knowledge graphs that uh, you know contain, I won't say all the knowledge about the world, but far more than what 40 humans can do even for working for a long time. Right? So uh, example would be UMLS or uh, medical uh, vocabulary. You know, years of evolution with many, many people have contributed to the, its development. So human collective intelligence has been captured in very large, core, you know, this knowledge basis that can be utilized. So we make the system smarter, not relying on few humans, but by tapping into this kind of uh, knowledge base. Now, here is an interesting thing: what it takes to make system uh, smarter and more intelligent and support understanding com co compared to the uh, uh, to, compared to the, the language models. So, just just pay attention to how you are understanding what I'm saying. You all have understanding of language syntax. You know what comma here means and not. You all have linguistic knowledge, such as the one that has been captured in WordNet. You all have common sense, conceptnet. We have broad-based general purpose knowledge. You know who is current prime minister of UK, and we have, you know, we'll have knowledge of some domains, and many different people have knowledge of different domains. So humans have domain-specific knowledge, and there are ontologies or knowledge graphs for each of them. I noted some of examples here. For the top one example could be DSM-5 for mental health. Right? So, um, just human, human, we as human get years of training. In the grade school, in, in early on, we are taught the syntax, we are taught the linguistics, common sense, we pick up on our own and, you know, your parents will guide you on some things and, you know, even brain is pretty smart, uh, learns with very few examples. And, you know, over the years, we retain the facts about various things and get expert in one or two or three domains. That process that works in human, we try to bring into the computational system. So, um, uh, in through the knowledge graphs or knowledge, uh, we have explicit model of recency and common sense supply missing knowledge a world as concepts or say, uh, that is what we do as opposed to world as probability that is what language models do user level expertise and safety constraints so uh, you know uh, there are been a variety of things over the years that we have developed so i had a early article on Shades of knowledge infused learning uh, for enhancing uh, deep learning. 
uh, and talked about three uh, broad categories, shallow, semi-deep and deep. So the shallow infusion was essentially taking um, uh, data and generating embedding and adding um, uh, that to the uh, deep neural network. So that was the shallow infusion. The semi deep was to take the knowledge and affect the attention mechanism. And then there was a deep infusion where you have that done at multiple levels of abstraction. Different knowledge is applicable for different purpose. Common sense knowledge has certain role in understanding domain specific knowledge is some other role right? and so then they both need to so this allows me to take multiple knowledge bases or knowledge graphs and incorporate knowledge in different layers of abstraction and that is how uh, the deep infusion system would be uh, and then basing based on that here you know just some idea of um, you know how some of the characteristics uh, and then uh, you know what you can do so u is unsatisfactory and you know M is uh, medium and H is high. So then I have, um, uh, you know, it just a general um, and this keep on this keeps on evolving. But in general, you have a feature abstraction layer. You have knowledge processing and understanding layer, you know, of the system. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, neural reasoning plus um, additional way to, you know, do uh, process guided reasoning. So this is where um, that medical practice guideline comes in. So not only it's a fact or a triple that you add to, uh, but uh, you uh, you know also govern the process. For example, if the uh, doctor, um, uh, if you go to doctor with high um, blood pressure, uh, uh, then the doctor will uh, need to rule out hyperthyroidism uh, uh, before concluding that you have hypertension, you, you, so the hypothyroidism requires a test and then require give you, uh, there are seven different classes of uh, uh, hypertension management drugs, you know, calcium channel blocker or beta blocker or whatever. And they are uh, in the context of patients, you know, uh, health condition, the right one is chosen. Sometimes two of them are chosen, and then uh, you know uh, thing is given. So that there's a process, and you know step by step things. That is what this we try to do. So before the transformers came along, uh, we had a work where um, uh, you took uh, knowledge from uh, DSM five, uh, which is the you know essentially. Uh, material on which mental health professionals are trained. So this is a med, you know, this is medical, uh, you know, literature. And these are variety of conditions, OCDs, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and suicidal, you know, this thing and so on and so forth, the so different. And um, uh, these are different uh, sources of, uh, uh, you know, different subreddits, these are different subreddits. And um, we try to, uh, you know, apply the vocabularies used for each of these things to understand on different uh, reddit and ultimately uh, that significantly improved so this uh, orange part is the um, uh, embedding part and this is the uh, neural part traditional part and combining them led to better self results so this was a, an example of a shallow infusion uh, but it still showed very good results if you see here uh, that uh, on the same data set, uh, lexical and syntactic features gave you the result with 30% error rate. All the way making you know improvements and adding more knowledge, it got it down to 0.025%, massive improvement. So it still can be pretty good, although this problem is not very uh, challenging or not, not as challenging or demanding. So uh, uh, classification problem, uh, you got all these results that can be more complex computational challenge where uh, it will not get as many as much uh, you know improvement as as this one so after neural network there have been um, you know, various techniques that have come in i won't discuss discuss in detail uh, one of them is called uh, k adapter is an example of shallow infusion but uh, you know if you ask the native language of monmuti is 
and the answer is uh, should be um, well uh, it is malayalam but if you think about uh, you know this uh, uh, you know roberta the ways uh, it will it gives you wrong no wrong answer k adapter gives you multiple answers but good thing is that the first first answer is correct but it should not be giving all the rest because there is no connection with manmuti and all the rest of them so the rest is made up The next one was a semi deep infusion. And uh, you know uh, what happens here is that it allows uh, it, 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 it. There is a um, uh, process of incorporating knowledge into the transformer layer and uh, it allows uh, you know uh, uh, better uh, clustering. Uh, then you can see uh, the the. Uh, the baseline. So in a way that is some improvement. Uh, there is a, another one. This is the one that we developed uh, called uh, uh, KI, uh, you know, knowledge infused learning uh, TDLR. And uh, there uh, we are able to do better because in the world model we can, uh, you know, classify is related to 14, 18 war, Austria Hungary. And first war and great war in different contexts, synonymy context versus you know relatedness, and that kind of uh, deeper knowledge is possible using this technique, uh, where uh, in different G tokens are connected to uh, different um, you know tokens in the neural network. Uh, that gives us that. I will pass those things. So uh, you know. Uh, now we, I'll give you some example of uh, this lifted uh, neural representative with knowledge graph for social good. Uh, so neural network abstract or contextualization, different types of knowledge, ability to apply process knowledge, and uh, then uh, you know improving the interaction with the system user uh, on their own concerns. That is the broader outline. One of the um, Corollary. One of the outcomes of these um, uh, system is that is that it supports explainability. So what happens is that here is your text from Reddit, and um, we are able to map various concepts here, phrases, into the concepts in the uh, knowledge graph. This is the knowledge graph um, from DSM five, and of course the knowledge graph also. This maps to this process, that one. Uh, and we know now that that is a, a subtype of disturbance in thinking. And, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, the definition of, um, uh, uh, you know, a term may involve disturbance in thinking, we would know that this belongs to that. So we can do this kind of taxonomic reasoning also. Uh, but nevertheless, what happens here is that uh, here's the definition. So the doctor, uh, you know, clinician is uh, trying to uh, determine whether this person has OCD uh, and then that uh, which people have obsessive, intrusive thoughts, something else. So you try to now map this to the concepts and that allow and then see if that deficient is satisfied. Now I can explain to the clinician why I'm calling this OCD or not OCD. Right? So there is an explainability which comes without that, you may still have a classification saying OCD, but you don't know why. Right? That's the black box nature of those, uh, you know, neural network things. So here is a step by step process of, uh, you know, wish to be dead, non specific active social thoughts, active social thoughts with some intent to act. Based on that, I come up with this label. Uh, that is in Columbia Suicide Risk Scale, uh, SSC, SSRS. And uh, I can tell you why I believe this is the best label and say this is the thought process that has gone through on this data. Right? So, um, so this is interpretable for system users, as that is clinicians and patients. That led to, you know, for example, agreement with the expert 
uh, LLMs gave you far less agreement than the uh, you know approach that we did. Here's an interesting example of safety. So um, we've been working on mental health for a while, but chatbots, uh, you know, th there is natural language generation possible, but it could, it's hard to control what they will come with. So it's possible that the language that the chatbot uses uh, is hurtful to the patient. As an example, here, patient is being asked by the chatbot, uh, this is a real example, uh, do you feel irritated or self-destructive? And doctors tell us this is not the way to do that. This will, you know, uh, get the patients to have negative thoughts. So um, converting that to, uh, you know, asking the more this information in a different language, using different language, is uh, makes this system safe. So we have various processes there for inclusion of knowledge using medical questionnaire, and you know, the safety lexicon that allows you to uh, rule out these kind of questions and uh, uh, you know ask uh, the more uh, benign questions um, here is an example of explainable food recommendation it shows you the complexity of the problem so uh, we uh, have built an application where you take photograph of the meal uh, and getting from that meal to say what is the nutrition and how it relates to your medical condition Let's say type 1 diabetes in children. We have current, right now, as we speak, um, uh, Dr. Lisa Knight, uh, my collaborator, is uh, giving our system to her patients uh, to test, uh, you know, uh, how well it, our system works. But it requires a lot of things. Of course, you need image understanding, segmenting, and all that stuff. It requires a very large data set and so on and so forth. But then you need to understand the recipe and ingredients. And you not only need to uh, do that, you also need to uh, come up with um, cooking action. The same food could be, uh, you know, could use baking versus broiling. Uh, the same food could be um, uh, fried in a, um, uh, a, you know, virgin or new oil or a reuse oil. The second one will have trans fat uh, and fairly negative, you know, bad uh, kind of, uh, you know, results in terms of nutrition. The first one does. In as you know, one uh, the recipe is fine if you bake, but not fine if you use some other method. So uh, uh, that involves a lot of knowledge, cooking process knowledge, domain knowledge of you know uh, cooking itself, disease specific knowledge, um, personalized health knowledge, and uh, with all these, uh, you can you know responses eat this food no, healthy uh, uh, ingredients vegetables unhealthy integrated ingredients, red meat, cooking method, baking, uh, energy none, uh, and, and daily value uh, uh, calorie within limit. Right? So that's the kind of thing that uh, the application does. Here's a very interesting example. Um, uh, just today, just yesterday, um, uh, or no, just in last week, um, uh, in a, a, a federal court in uh, you know, US uh, essentially prohibited the government uh, but, uh, you know, from telling the social media companies uh, what to do with regards to disinformation. Okay. First speech trumps in any situation in US. So now government has no role in telling the social media company about disinformation. We know how poor, you know, very negative impact, and I studied um, of social media on election, and it has been terrible, uh, you know, uh, the 10% uh, of the U.S. population has, agree, uh, uh, has agreed that they have knowingly forwarded misinformation. Okay. And a very large major, a majority has, you know, uh, consumed, uh, uh, you know, misinformation. So, uh, you know, I think the societal harm is immense of this technology. So uh, while I'm very aware of uh, some huge benefits of, of AI. Uh, they, uh, um, uh, my afternoon panel statement would be that um, uh, we don't, you know, I think we are under appreciating the harmful effect of AI. And it has been systemic on democracy, on institutions, um, and, and many other things. Um, um, the whole politics in the US is left and right is totally broken, as so is in the UK. Uh, 
So um, here, this is a real tweet. I got to work with Magic Johnson last month when we he came to the hospital. He donated blood, blood, you know, uh, blood. Well, the fact is that um, first of all, you have to recognize this is Magic Johnson or not, and then whether there is a blood donation or not. And while you do all that, you need to uh, figure out uh, there is a knowledge base, uh, uh, you know, that tells us that uh, Magic Johnson is HIV. He can't be donating blood. So, uh, you know, you need that kind of knowledge to say that, uh, you know, um, this is fake news. Right? So, um, uh, and, and, and we have developed a system called 5W QA answer, uh, based explainability uh, that currently works on textual data. So it asks five questions. Who claim, what claim, when claim, where claim, and why claim? And you know, for this thing, it will create, you know, this understanding and give you the caution or it can tell something or not tell if you verify or not verify and so on and so forth. Um, journalists, if you go to PolitiFact or you go to any of the major uh, fact checking website, they can afford to check only a handful of uh, facts uh, or something is fact or not. And they give the level of, uh, you know, pants on fire to, you know, it's good kind of thing. It is, it takes very time, it's very time consuming job for human. So automating that uh, using this kind of tool or semi automating that. Uh, for example, uh, let the human make the final judgment, but all the things that he needs or she needs to make the judgment are given there. And for something that system cannot find, let the human do it. But it can be, you know, significant. There can be significant scaling for for doing this. And then, uh, you know, um, uh, you what you do is um, going from the processing simply to understanding, uh, and and then helping make decision. So the takeaway is that if the system were to give user level explanation, it'll need to incorporate use conceptual models, vocabulary, knowledge graph, uh, used by the user or human. A uh, uh, purely data driven system can at best use explanation that ML and engineers developers can use. Knowledge is multifaceted, so I presented the diverse knowledge to support different levels of precision for natural language understanding. There will be different knowledge for, of, uh, for abstraction wall in image understanding activity. The same system I showed for uh, Magic Johnson currently works with uh, uh, text, but we are in the process of developing system that works with text and images. You, should you bring knowledge to the data level or embed, that's called embedding, or bring data to the knowledge level, learn from data and align with the knowledge. For less demanding intellectual activities like classification, prediction, recommendation, the formal will do, which is more scalable, uh, you know, simpler. But for more demanding intellectual activities, <coughs> decision making, taking actions, with explanation, the later will be necessary. That probably, yeah, there's a lot of information on various things, and I, you know, team. This is the institute and my PhD students. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. First, thank you very much for the inspirational presentation. Really enjoyed it, and um, um, I, I also particularly appreciated the kind of applications that you are doing. So it's uh, it will be very useful for now and for the future. And the problems that you find yeah, that you find significant, like for example, the disintegration of politics and the role of this information and that. Anyway, but my question is this. This is really intriguing, and I do have a sense that there is some truth. There is truth in what you argue here for neuro-symbolic AI, that uh, machine learning by itself will not give us you know, the, the systems that will do this kind of higher level reasoning. So my question is this. Sometimes the knowledge 
is faulty. <laughs> and I wonder whether we can use the symbolic AI to correct it. That's really important for the kind of applications that I'm addressing. Why? Because when we design a system, we try to predict, for example, how it will fail an engineering system. So I work a lot with cars and this kind of stuff. Really? Yeah, with cars, cars. Yeah, yeah, you also think yeah. This. so when we design something uh, and we try to predict how it will fail, for example, we make predictions about causes and effects of failure. Uh, so for, between symptoms and causes to do diagnosis or effects to do prognosis, etc. This knowledge, which is not generic knowledge about the domain, specific about the system, it is it, it can be faulty, uh, but it can be useful as well because we can calibrate what we observe in the context of this knowledge. But the problem is that this model that we have then, the knowledge, the symbolic knowledge, because we are talking about rules then. This symbolic knowledge may be faulty. And I was wondering, I think it's a difficult problem, but I was wondering whether you have some insight. Can we use this machine learning, you know, what, what we observe and what we can learn from data to sort of try and correct this model, this knowledge? The first thought that comes to mind is that in your particular example, this system will tell you what knowledge got applied. So if the knowledge is faulty, at least you have a way for human to uh, you know, to, uh, the, to spot it. To spot it would be very good. Yeah. I, I, do you remember the OCD uh, example I gave? Obsessive composite disorder example where there's experience really. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here. Will you make the slides available? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I'd like to have good. a look because there's, two, there's a lot of information yeah. in there <laughs> and there's a lot of applications. And yeah, yeah we, we need to look a little bit more closely to yeah, close yeah, your paper. And I'll request in fact, access to your video myself because I put it on my thing. But yeah. I, uh, my prior uh, presentation of this is also recorded in something like that. So both the slides and your. Yeah, yeah. I also had an idea. And, uh, an idea came to me while I was listening to the presentation, and I'd like to, to say it. You talked about a lot about explainability, and I think explainability indeed is a key component of what we call knowledge. And I think this yeah. has been recognized a long time ago, and it brought into mind the first attempt to separate belief from knowledge was from Plato, mm. who says that knowledge is justified mm. through belief, not just true belief. It's not enough for something to be true. It has to be justified. If there's no explanation, it could be by chance true. And we also don't know how it can be false in a different context. So, so that's, that's, so it's really important and I mean, you seem to be doing very, you know, excellent work in, in this area and, and a long time. So it's really, really, really interesting. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I think 1% of the companies say that they want to explain AI. Yeah, so there's such a need. It's just that uh, the um, uh, Zerky AI has in such a, you know, scalability uh, that uh, uh, people are currently rushing to use it. Uh, but they are scaling back. So just uh, two days ago, or just yesterday or two days ago, in the news that uh, the uh, number of chat GPT users went down by 100,000 people. First time, <laughs> massive growth. Yeah, it was like down. Uh, and this is uh, maybe because I guess students are uh, going on somewhere, <laughs> or it is because people are seeing the problems. Sorry, I was very interested to, to hear about your work with the DSM. Now, it, it seems to me, I'm not by no means an expert, but the DSM is, has grown enormously over the last few years, yes. and the specificity of the diagnoses in it gets more and more. It's almost like it's been designed as a classification system for AI yeah. in that sense. And I wonder, some of those, those diagnoses are really almost descriptions of collections of symptoms rather than underlying conditions. In many fields, I, think. Um, I wonder whether we're losing something by trying to, to classify everything to that level of detail and, and constraining the system to a particular viewpoint. Now, early on in your talk, you mentioned about um, the, the, the structures, the mechanisms that, that consultants use to diagnose things and how it's better to work that way because the consultants understand. But if the, if the AI system 
can do the same job and can spot other things that aren't in that, how to put it, in that construction, if you like, are we losing the ability for the AI to provide more information or to provide new information by mm. classifying everything so tightly? Yes and no. Uh, first of all, I can't make an authoritative statement about incipient, you know, I can talk about more technology and technologies and computer science, but um, I know um, because I work with quite a few mental health professionals that not everybody likes this. I know that uh, not everybody likes PSQ9, which is for the depression or I or, or yeah, GAD7, which is for anxiety. Yeah. So these are the screening tests. Yeah. So oh, I have another work which I didn't present where uh, in addition to the nine PSQ9 questions, uh, the clinicians I work with, uh, you know, suggested we add three more. Right. So, and, and if I work with other physicians, they would have asked something else. So we will have to construct the system to fit what the, you know, uh, ultimately the clinician is a decision maker uh, and the patient is relying on the patient to give you the right, uh, you know, uh, solution, you know, whether medication or uh, meditation or whatever they are going to suggest. So we'll just have to fit what the experts uh, think that is. So I do not believe that these AI systems are going to, uh, should be just allowed to solve the problem uh, and, and that these are going to, uh, in any foreseeable future, replace uh, doctors or such. Um, but um, I think that they will be a very uh, good tool to find, uh, you know, to process a lot of possible data. So these days, the patient-generated data is growing enormously. Uh, we, have, we have smart watches, we uh, have social media posts, all of these are telling us about, um, you know, we've done work on prediction of sociability uh, based on social media posts of humans, and that, that you know, it has, it's very promising. So, uh, but um, we'll have to rely on the you know, clinicians to do that. So. The idea would be that this would be uh, uh, scaling that job. You will identify a lot of things that they might even miss. You will make the things much faster. For example, the screen test can be done at home. And then if you are at risk, then you say, you know, talk to the clinician. Uh, it will also ask, uh, also help you implement uh, the routine maintenance. So we are building the mental health chatbot for rural South uh, Carolina because the access to the you know, clinical health is very poor. Even in the urban, you know, South Kenya, it is a six week wait before you can talk to a mental health profession. So, uh, is that, a, you know, that's a state of the art and, and the NHS is no good, no better. So, uh, uh, while I would not, in the, in the foreseeable future, in the near future rather, I would not want my uh, chatbot to uh, do initial diagnosis. But if the diagnosis is, um, you know, a mild uh, form of uh, depression, uh, then uh, if it requires cognitive behavioral therapy or it requires, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, uh, then the uh, self-management as of it. I, I, I defined a, a framework I call augmented personalized health. It starts with self-monitoring, um, uh, uh, self collecting the data, self-appraisal, saying what medical condition it is. Am I, uh, you know, uh, I, do I have severe asthma versus, so what is my equivalent of my digital phenotyping of my asthma control test, let's say. I have project with, uh, evaluated 200 asthma control pain, uh, you know, children with asthma. Uh, and then self-management, meaning I have uh, a chronic disease and I need uh, routine management, but within the scope of the, you know, discharge summary. Then I have intervention, where uh, the technology assisted you in teleconsulting or you know or getting access to the doctor, and then I have this is progression and prediction how you go over the lifetime. So this is the five stage of um, you know health management, self management where I am under the routine care, I have a stable you know process, but I need um, uh, you know technology support. So technology can say uh, if you're asthma, uh, you're not taking control of medication. Uh, uh, and you have to risk, uh, you know, take rescue medication very often, uh, that is wrong, uh, that uh, it will remind you that, you know, take your control medication time, it will tell you to take rescue medication with you because pollen is high today. But all is in the context of what the doctor says, this is your profile. And anything outside, get intervention.
Any questions from the online audience? Uh, anyone they think uh, we've got Brian has a question. Oh, it's kind of an optional question. I was waiting till the series question ended. And um, so perhaps it's a question from Fantasyland. I like the movie Blade Runner very much, which is based on the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And if you don't know the work of science fiction, the question might not make sense. But the Harrison Ford character's job is to detect artificial intelligences by asking them a series of questions, which actually you kind of did. That's what reminded me, several of your slides were questions that said, well, quite clearly a human could do that, but an artificial intelligence couldn't see that Napoleon's horse was white. And so, you know, we're getting towards a sequence of questions that will say where this is the Turing test, whether we are talking to an artificial intelligence or a real intelligence. And will there be a bank of questions? That's one of the things I was thinking. But the next thing was you started to think up questions to work out somebody's mental health state. Later on, the AI was thinking of the questions. So like a software engineer, I was going to plug one piece of software into the other piece of software. So we've got AI actually telling one AI telling the other AI, you are wrong because. <laughs> and the AI is now training AI yeah. at AI speed. And we're almost getting to the state where that can happen. You can have a lot of possible negative consequences. But coming to your first observation, let me observe. Um, I just, uh, my team just submitted two papers to one of the top conferences. Um, one of the paper was uh, to, uh, uh, you know, show hallucination index for different models, uh, how, you know, how much hallucinations they have, what kind of condition they have, increased in exclusion. The second paper we submitted was um, detectability of human versus AI. There is a very popular um, uh, uh, program on the web. Uh, where you just go on it and go send you some information and interact with you, and uh, you are supposed to detect whether uh, that you know is coming from human or AI, and uh, you know you should you know check out. So we we, we did then we kind of fall on to that to uh, really develop a serious benchmark for end classification system for uh, system versus human, uh, so, so human versus AI, and how do you go about detecting it? So it's a very uh, active area of research, very interesting. Uh, and it is, you know, getting more and more complicated. Okay. Just that's one question. Oh my gosh, that was a question. Yeah. <laughs> so years ago in my past life, I, I had privileged to work with Donald Mickey. And years and years ago, there was things called chatbots before all this came out and, and the Turing test. Donald Mickey like, or well, he was it was UK work. He worked with Turing a long time ago. He died in '96 in a car crash. But yeah, I worked with him and his wife and Claude Summer, who was in Australia, and it was on chatbots originally because our part of our work was semantic similarity. So when you put word on there, it kind of like resonated with the past. But my question was, going back all those years now, low language resource models, so Arabic, and obviously you've got traditional, you've got modern, you've got Urdu. We had a lot of challenges then in terms of translating um, kind of ontologies, because again, you can't translate ontologies because it's cultural and, and all that stuff comes in as well. I just wonder what your experience was um, in this work. Have you done multiple languages? No, I just uh, uh, have a um, uh, you know person visiting us from India, and he is working on uh, you know uh, the low resource language models. So that what we started. So yeah, it's really exciting. I'll be following you to hear about that. Yeah, yeah that's really exciting stuff. So. Okay, thank you so much. I'm quite conscious that I need to take this for, for, for the lunch and we need to go for lunch as well. So thank you so thank much you. for coming and thank you.